good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, alumni of uh, Princeton University, welcome back. It's always good to have you back. I'm Brad Wilson. I'm executive director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. We're part of the Department of Politics here at Princeton. Uh, we're the sponsor of this afternoon's event. The Madison Program, if I may say a word or two about it, is, is now in its 18th year here at Princeton. Uh, it's never been stronger or more active uh, than it is now in serving the educational mission of Princeton University. For this, we're deeply grateful to, uh, for the generosity of alumni of Princeton on whom we have depended for support. The mission of the Madison Program is to promote the study of constitutional law and political thought with a focus on American constitutionalism. Today, we're pleased to offer uh, this event with Professor Robert George. Robert George is the successor to Woodrow Wilson, Edward, Edward S. Corwin, Alpheus T. Mason, and Walter Murphy as the holder of the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence uh, here at Princeton. Um, I don't know if we have any former students of uh, Edward S. Corwin or Woodrow Wilson in the room, <laughs> but I expect there may be a, a student or two from the days of Alpheus T. Mason and certainly of Walter Murphy. Uh, Professor George is the founder and director of the James Madison Program. He served as chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom and on the United States Commission on Civil Rights and the President's Council on Bioethics. He's, he was a judicial fellow at the Supreme Court of the United States where he received the Justice Tom C. Clark Award. A Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Swarthmore, he holds the degree of JD and an MTS from Harvard University, and the degrees of DPhil, BCL, and DCL from Oxford University. In addition to 19 honorary degrees, he's a recipient of <laughs> the United States Presidential Citizens Medal, the Honorific Medal of the Defense of Human Rights of the Republic of Poland, and Princeton's President's Award for Distinguished Teaching. That's just a very brief introduction. But <laughs> you can find a fuller one on the back of the card that you might have picked up coming in. Uh, Professor George is uh, going to um, uh, revisit, uh, help us revisit uh, the celebrated course in constitutional interpretation that began with Woodrow Wilson. So please join me in welcoming Professor Robert George. Thank you, Brad. Well, thank you very much. I'm so grateful uh, to Brad Wilson for his wonderful service as executive director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions, and as leader of the finest staff in Princeton <laughs> University. And several of those staff members are, are, are with us. And I want to express my gratitude uh, to Debbie Parker, to Chanel Duke, to Evie Bailing, and to Dwani uh, Wang. Uh, the Madison program has been going for 18 years. Uh, we're flourishing. We're grateful for the generosity of alumni that make this possible. For people who want to learn more about the Madison program, I've asked Chanel to uh, put up a, uh, an address there. You can just go to jmadison at princeton.edu. Uh, it'll tell you how to be in touch with us. You can access our website. Uh, you can have a look at the activities, the courses, the conferences, the lectures. Uh, all of which, by the way, or almost all of which are open to the public, so anytime you happen to be in town, there will be Madison program events going on, and you're very welcome uh, to attend them. Uh, I want to welcome the alumni back, and uh, for those of you um, in mixed marriages, the spouses of alumni uh, who did not go to Princeton, uh, it's really great to have you back here uh, with us. Uh, you should be very proud of your university for a whole lot of reasons. And among those uh, is the fact that at this university, we genuinely have a wide diversity of viewpoints represented in our student body and on our faculty. And we have a truly vibrant, robust, and free discussion and debate on this campus. I know that you've watched television, and you've read the newspapers, and you've read the websites, and you know the sorts of things that have happened at other institutions with speakers being 
shouted down and with um, the people being disinvited and, and, and all that kind of stuff. There's very, really very, very little, if any, of that kind of thing uh, here. And that's in large part uh, because our administration under President Eisgruber uh, has done a wonderful job of setting a tone of robust but civil discourse uh, on our campus. And the Madison program tries to do its part uh, to ensure that wide diversity of views and to ensure that vibrant conversation, and we really feel supported uh, by the university. The alumni are part of that. Uh, it's, it's really an effort of administration, faculty, students, and alums lending to Princeton the wonderful ethos of inquiry, of free discussion, of truth seeking, uh, of robust discourse uh, that marks this institution and really makes it stand out today. I, I say that with regret, uh, but makes it stand out today from so many other institutions. I wish all institutions were like uh, Princeton, uh, but we do try to set a good example, and I'm proud to be associated with Princeton University. Uh, I didn't have the honor of going here as a student. You did, or many of you uh, uh, did. Uh, but I've been here now for 33 years. I just completed my 33rd year, as a matter of fact, of happy uh, service on the faculty, teaching the most wonderful students anybody could ever hope to have the opportunity to <coughs> encounter. Uh, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Uh, I've had many uh, invitations to move to other places. Uh, it has been really not at all difficult to turn those down because this institution is such a wonderful place. And among the highlights of my 33 years has been teaching the course in constitutional interpretation, a course that I um, inherited from my revered immediate predecessor, uh, Walter Murphy, for whom I precepted. Uh, it's Walter who taught me what I know <laughs> about the Constitution uh, and what I know in large part about, uh, about teaching. He, in turn, had precepted for Alpheus T. Mason, who, in turn, had precepted for Edward S. Corn, who, in turn, had precepted for Wilson when the preceptorial system was first put uh, into place. I feel so blessed to be the unworthy current <laughs> occupant of that chair and heir to that magnificent uh, tradition. And again, constitutional interpretation, the course, is at the heart of that. Now I see some of my own uh, former students in constitutional interpretation here, so you're not going to be hearing anything new uh, today. <laughs> Uh, uh, some of you, I know, were students of Professor Murphy, and I suspect at least a few, yes, okay, some head shaking, at least a few uh, for, uh, students of Professor uh, Mason. Uh, the course has not, yeah, okay, I see someone up there. The course has really not changed all that much. It's still a GPA destroyer. <laughs> <laughs> i tell you a story, I'll tell you a story. So I'm at a dinner in Washington, D.C., just a couple of months ago. Very handsome, engaging young man in his 30s uh, introduces himself to me. He said, I'm, I'm going to use his name. He said, I'm Mike Gallagher. I said, I'm, thank you. I'm Robert George. Good to meet you. He said, uh, I went to Princeton. Oh, I said, is that right? He said, yeah, I was an undergraduate there. And then after Princeton, I you know, went into the Army, and I served in Iraq and Afghanistan. I said, did you see combat? Oh, yeah. Uh, he said, what do you do now? He said, I'm a congressman from uh, Wisconsin. I said, well, thank you very much for your service to our country. Uh, did you have any graduate? Oh, yeah, I went to law school. Oh, gosh, you've accomplished a lot. You, you couldn't be more than 35 years old. I said, by the way, you know, did, did you, I don't remember, did you take any of my courses? And he said, no. He said, you know, I thought about taking constitutional interpretation, but, and I said, you were worried about your grade point average. <laughs> And he sheepishly said, yeah. <laughs> this guy fought ISIS in Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> What's that all about? <laughs> but constitutional interpretation is just such a pleasure to teach. And at the heart of that is something that I deeply believe, and that is that the Constitution of the United States is the greatest practical achievement in the history of political science. Establishing Republican government on terms that can last. Making possible something that many people at the time of our founding thought was impossible based on the historical record. And that is a republic that could survive all the afflictions 
that had destroyed republics in the ancient world, or the medieval, or the Renaissance period. Now, when I call the American Constitution, the Constitution of the United States, the greatest practical achievement of political science, I'm not suggesting that our founders were political scientists in the sense of people who attend the American Political Science Association Convention or have PhDs or teach at uh, universities in departments of political science. No, they weren't political scientists in that sense. But they were political scientists in a more fundamental sense. They were learned men, people who were well versed in the whole tradition of political thought going back from the Enlightenment period all the way back through the medieval period and into the ancient world, and who sought to create free institutions, durable free institutions for free men and women that would last based on thinking through the facts about human nature and how to arrange institutions realistically, given the facts about human nature, to enable Republican government to survive. They wanted to use the old noggin. In the very first Federalist paper, Publius, of course they used that pseudonym, Publius, tells us that the proposed Constitution, and remember the Federalist Papers were op-ed pieces. They were newspaper pieces designed to uh, persuade the citizens of New York to ratify the proposed Constitution. But in that very first Federalist Paper, this project is described as an experiment. It falls to us, Publius says, to determine once and for all whether we can have government by reflection and choice, that is, by using the old noggin, reasoning, or whether it is the eternal fate of human beings to be governed by accident and force. They were going to design a government from scratch based on reasoning, based on thinking, a government that, unlike the governments they knew in Europe or elsewhere, did not arise just organically over time. Britain has a constitution, an unwritten constitution, but it's a constitution that developed organically out of society over many, many years and generations and decades and indeed centuries. The American founders sought to prove through this experiment in ordered liberty that we could have government by reflection and choice, and not just any old government, not just government of the people, which all government is, not just government for the people, which all good government is, even if it's the government of a benign despot, but this very special thing, government by the people, Republican government, the kind of government that had always failed in the past. When Lincoln used that famous phrase, government of the people, by the people, and for the people, in the Gettysburg Address, he was recalling the experimental nature of the American founding and the American Constitution. He was remembering and recalling to his fellow citizens that the founders themselves considered their handiwork to be an experiment, a test of whether Republican government could be made durable could survive, an experiment which, as an experiment in the very nature of things, could fail, as previous attempts at Republican government had failed. And Lincoln understood the Civil War that he himself had chosen to fight. He could have let the Southern Confederacy secede, but he understood the Civil War, which he chose to fight as a test of whether Republican government could, in fact, survive. So where, what's the context of that phrase, of the people, by the people, and for the people? It's Lincoln 
saying to his fellow citizens, I fought the war, which is still going in July of 1863 at Gettysburg, or later that year when he's actually giving the address. I fought the war at enormous cost in blood and treasure. Professor McPherson, the wonderful Civil War historian in our Department of History, now emeritus, says 750,000 deaths in a population of what, 19 million? I fought the war because had we let the Southern Confederacy secede, had we let the Southern states secede, it would have been the end of Republican government. The breaking up of the Union would have portended the breaking up of the remaining northern states and eventually the breaking up of the Confederate states, the collapse of Republicanism, the rise of a strongman, the rise of a despot, just as had happened so often in the past. So Lincoln concludes the Gettysburg Address by saying that the war tests whether government of the people, by the people, and for the people will perish from, what are the remaining two words? The earth. the earth. Not just the North American continent. It'll be tried here and fail, and then they'll try it someplace again, then they'll try it someplace again. No, Lincoln knew that if it failed here, this was the last hurrah for republicanism people would conclude that it just doesn't work, that human beings are not the kinds of creatures that are fit for self-government, government by the people. The best we can hope for is government for the people by a benign despot. And that would be the end. The experiment would have failed. The founders would have been whatever the opposite of vindicated is. So, when I think of the Constitution of the United States, I think of it as a practical achievement of political science. Something that actually does guide us and has enabled us to preserve free institutions. Has our history been perfect? Far from it. We were conceived in liberty, but also conceived in original sin the original sin being slavery. Jefferson, who wrote those famous words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those words of the Declaration, which are meant to be operationalized by the Constitution, he himself, of course, was a slaveholder. Never gave up his slaves. Didn't even free them as Washington did in his will. He was too deeply in debt. Jefferson was a high liver, among other things. <laughs> so there's that contradiction right at the very heart of things. That original sin, that it cost 750,000 lives eventually to expiate, and whose consequences, of course, we continued and continue to endure, to live with. And yet, those constitutional ideals still remain the touchstone. When Martin Luther King is advocating for civil rights in the 1950s and 60s, he never joins those who say, we need a new constitution. We need a new set of principles. No, what King says is we need to be true, we need to be faithful to the principles of the Constitution and the Declaration. Like Lincoln, in the 1850s and 60s, King in the 1950s and 60s is recalling to the American people their fundamental commitments. Commitments that they've never fully lived up to. And commitments that no people will ever fully live up to. But which we can live up to more fully and more fully, if we are willing to. So while the Constitution is not an idol, I-D-O-L, to be worshipped, only God is to be worshipped. No human thing is to be worshipped. I think we're right to revere it 
as a truly magnificent tool to preserve our freedom. Considered not just as the right to do as you please, but as the right to participate in the great project of government, the right to self-government. Now, my view is not universally shared. It's not universally shared by constitutional scholars. Many have a much more critical, even dismissive attitude toward the Constitution. It's not shared by all judges. Let me read you some words from a very prominent judge, probably the judge in our time who has the status, which some judge does at every time in US history, of being the guy most likely to get to the Supreme Court who didn't make it there. And for our time, that's Judge Richard Posner. Any of you familiar with Judge Posner? Yeah, many of you are. Now, you don't get more prominent without getting on to the Supreme Court. <laughs> you don't get more prominent than, than Richard Posner. A distinguished academic, law professor at the University of Chicago, founding father in his own right, and that is founding father of the field of law and economics. Distinguished judge, uh, placed on the U.S. Court of Appeals by President uh, Reagan back in the uh, 1980s, extremely influential in philosophy of law, in administrative law, in constitutional law. And here's what he has to say about the Constitution of the United States. And I quote, I see absolutely no value to a judge of spending decades, years, months, weeks, days, hours, minutes, or seconds studying the Constitution or the history of its enactment or its amendments or its implementation across the centuries uh, and, of course, less for many of the amendments. 18th century guys, however smart, could not foresee the culture, technology, et cetera, of the 21st century, which means that the original Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the post-Civil War amendments, including the 14th, do not speak today, unquote. <laughs> if Judge Posner, <laughs> Steve Whelan, <laughs> Preceptor in the Constitutional Interpretation exactly. course. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So he's trained to hiss when people, <laughs> when people say wrong things. If Judge Posner's right, then I'm completely wrong. If Judge Posner's right, then it's time to bring down the curtain on Princeton's famous course in Constitutional Interpretation. Because it's done, it's over. The Constitution is meaningless. It's just a museum piece. It belongs under some glass down in the National Archives for people to go and look at. But to use his words, it doesn't speak today. But I don't believe that. I think it does speak today. Because its principles are timeless. The institutions it creates and arranges have an independent and powerful reality. And like Dr. King and like Lincoln, I would say that we go wrong not by slavishly adhering to the Constitution. We don't adhere to it slavishly enough. We go wrong by failing to follow those constitutional principles. Where we've gone wrong, we've gone wrong because we have not been faithful to the heritage that is bequeathed to us by our founding fathers for all their faults. Now, often I'll begin the course in constitutional interpretation by asking my students, some of you will remember this, how did the framers try via the Constitution to prevent tyranny and protect liberty? How's the Constitution designed to do that? After all, these 18th century guys, as uh, Posner, not inaccurately, characterizes them. These 18th century guys had fought a revolution against the most powerful nation on earth, Great Britain. They'd fought a revolution that they were almost certain to lose, but they fought it anyway, and miraculously they won. They fought a revolution to overthrow what they regarded as tyranny. 
If you want to see the bill of particulars of what they thought was tyranny, read on past that sentence I quoted in the Declaration of Independence. It will tell you about all the unjust, oppressive actions of the British Crown. But once their revolution was successful, once the miracle occurred, once they won, the next question was, how do we avoid simply reproducing tyranny here? We don't want to overthrow the tyranny of a foreign power simply to create our own homegrown tyranny. How do we do that? Now, I ask my students, if the Constitution was the mechanism, and of course we had that period with the Articles of Confederation, but that didn't work out perfectly well. So they go back and they give it another try. Originally the plan was to reform the Articles, but eventually we get a new proposed Constitution. If the Constitution is the method, how's the Constitution supposed to accomplish the goal? Now let me tell you what a typical answer is. Now my Princeton students, so many of you were Princeton students yourselves, whether you were mine or not, but Princeton students are really, really smart. And they are really, really well educated. Do you know what the percentage of applicants admitted was last year? Under 6%. And that's from an already self-selected pool of overachievers. We get the best and the brightest, the best of the best, the cream of the crop. So these are not dummies and they're not ignorant. But here is a typical response. Well, Professor George, I'll tell you how the Constitution was designed by our framers to protect liberty and to prevent tyranny. Very wisely, our founding fathers included a Bill of Rights. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and empowered an unelected and electorally unaccountable judiciary to enforce those Bill of Rights protections. A judiciary could, that could do that because they were immunized against political retaliation. They serve for life term, that is on good behavior. They can only be removed for crimes and high crimes and misdemeanors. Their compensation can't be reduced during their terms in office. So because they were immunized from politics, they were in a position to protect individuals and minorities against tyranny, the tyranny of the majority, the tyranny that they were worried about in creating a basically democratic system. Now, enough of you giggled <laughs> when I mentioned they included a Bill of Rights to reveal to me that many of you know that is not the right answer. <laughs> Which is great because that means I have something to teach them in constitutional interpretation. <laughs> Otherwise, if they knew it all, and that's what you worry about with Princeton students, they're so smart and they're so well educated that they know it all and there's not gonna be anything to teach them. But at least in constitutional interpretation, civic education in high schools is um, inadequate enough that we still have things to teach. <laughs> so what's the right answer? If what I've just given is the wrong answer, what's the right answer? All right. Can any of you remember, those of you who had constitutional interpretation, how did our framers seek to protect liberty and prevent tyranny? Micah. Uh, checks and balances in federalism, we created just enough structure to keep things going, but not enough power for any part of the, uh, of the government to tyrannize any other part. Bingo! <laughs> you can teach the course, Micah, you should come back. <laughs> when I'm on leave, just don't take my job. When I'm on leave, you can. <laughs> yeah, Micah nailed it. By limiting 
and by checking the power of government. So the American founders came up with a genuinely new idea. There aren't very many things new under the sun. This was new. And that genuinely new idea was to create a central government very different from the governments of Europe, from the government of France or the government of England or any of the great empires, the other great empires. The central government would not be given what the central government in, let's say, England or let's say France has, general jurisdiction. The central government, the government of the United States, will not be given plenary power. Rather, the government of the United States, the central government, would be a government of delegated and enumerated powers and therefore a government of limited powers. So you can note this down if you're taking notes. <laughs> Distinguish a government of general jurisdiction, that is a government that has whatever powers it thinks are needed to protect the common good. Government of general jurisdiction. Distinguish that from a government of delegated and enumerated powers. That is a government that has only the powers that have been given to it, either expressly in the enumeration of the powers or impliedly, powers that are necessary and proper to use the language of the Constitution itself to the effectuation of the expressly delegated powers. Now, of course, we inherited our general legal system from the British, so we had, except in Louisiana, what's called the common law system. And the common law had a particular way of describing governments of general jurisdiction. That is, a government of general jurisdiction exercises police powers. Police is not meant to imply uh, directly, you know, the, the, the guys in the blue suits and the bobby hats and things like that. But it means policy powers, general powers, and more specifically, the powers to protect public health, safety, and morals, and to advance the common good. In England, for example, the police powers rested with the central administration. The powers of other governments, let's say the governments of the counties, Essex or Sussex, or Oxfordshire, or Kent. The governments of the counties were derivative, their power was derivative of the power of the central government. The central government could give it to them, but if it didn't like the way they were exercising it, the central government could take it back or override the decisions of the counties. Same with the municipalities, York or Cambridge. or Leeds, or for your Beatles fans, Liverpool. Their power was purely derivative. General jurisdiction, the power to protect public health, safety, and morals, and advance the common good, existed in the central government. And of course, the system was parliamentary. It was a monarchy, but the democratic element, the parliament, was one in which there was no separation between the executive and the legislative power. Now contrast this with the idea of the American founders, proposed in the Constitution and eventually ratified. The national government would not be given general jurisdiction. That, the founders reasoned, was too risky a thing to do. That's how we got the tyranny under old King George III. Too much power in the hands of the central government. The protection of liberty is to be found in the diffusion of power. And the theory of the national government as a government of delegated and enumerated and therefore limited powers was meant to effectuate that diffusion of power. We protect liberty 
by limiting the power of the potentially tyrannical central government. But surely somebody has to have general jurisdiction. I mean, you can't list all the things that government needs to do. You couldn't do it in the 18th century. You certainly couldn't do it today in our complex world. So general jurisdiction has to be in somebody's hands. Police powers, to use the common law uh, language, the police powers to protect public health, safety, and morals and advance the common good has to be somewhere. If the national government, the central government, doesn't have it, where is it under the Constitution that the framers gave us? Who knows the answer? States. The states. Unlike the national government, the states are governments of general jurisdiction. They exercise police powers. Their powers extend to public health, safety, and morals, and the overall common good. In other words, they have any power they need to advance the common good unless that power has been prohibited to the states by the national government, by, I'm sorry, by the, scratch national government, by the Constitution, or that power has been given exclusively to the national government. Everybody with me? So we have a system quite unlike the one in England or France. The relationship of the national government and the provinces, or the national government and the counties, in our case, the language of states, the national government and the states, is quite radically different. Now, under our Constitution, the ultimate sovereign is who? First three words of the Constitution are, we the people. But to the extent that we can talk about government sovereignty, who has sovereignty in the United States? The question turns out to have a complex answer. It is a dual sovereignty. Sovereignty exists not exclusively in the national government. They are sovereign in areas where they have been given delegated powers. And in those areas, they are supreme. This Constitution and laws made under it by the national government are the supreme law of the land. Treaties, too, when they've been properly ratified by the national government. Laws of the land. But where power has not been delegated to the national government, it remains with the state. So in those areas, the states are sovereign. Their power is not purely derivative. It's not like the provinces of France or the counties of England. And so the hope was, the experiment was, that will protect liberty and will prevent tyranny in part by limiting the authority of the most dangerous liberty imperiling power. That is the central power. Now Micah mentioned something else in his wonderful little summary. It's not just that the Constitution will give us a dual sovereignty, will divide power, will limit the power of far away, central, potentially tyrannical national government. Even within the national government, power will be broken up, divided. Nobody will have unchecked power. There's another constant threat to liberty, unchecked power. You might get a good guy with unchecked power, but given human nature and original sin, Madison learned a lot about the Presbyterian view of man when he was at Princeton studying with John Witherspoon. <laughs> You're much more likely over time to have, to use a phrase of a friend of mine, bad czars than good czars. <laughs> you might get lucky this time or that time have a good czar. His unchecked power will be used for nothing but shedding light and roses. But more often, it will be abused. Human nature being what it is. Human sinfulness being what it is. 
If you want a wonderful description of the depravity of man, read Federalist Paper Number 10, written by Madison. John Witherspoon's hand is all over that thing. <laughs> John Calvin's hand is all over that thing. <laughs> the Calvin who said, and, and I've always resisted looking this up for fear that it would turn out not to be true that he said it. <laughs> so um, I, I've avoided that. But the Calvin who is said to have said that on the day of judgment, even the elect will be obnoxious in the sight of God. That's how fallen, <laughs> how totally depraved we are. Federalist number 10 will paint you that picture. So we need power checking power. So we have, in addition to federalism, the dual sovereignty of states and the national government, the division of power, the limiting of national power by the delegated powers theory, we have the separation of powers within the national government. Instead of unifying legislative and executive power, as in the parliamentary systems, we're going to separate them. We'll have a president, and the executive power of the United States will be vested in him. But we'll have a Congress, independent, and the legislative power of the United States will be vested there. And guess what? We got something else. A separate and independent third branch of government, not just a tool of the executive, the judicial branch. And Article 3 says the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and such, uh, use an unfortunate term here, inferior courts as Congress shall from time to time ordain and establish. And so we have a system, and here the civics classes are pretty good. They do tell our students in high school about the checks and balances. The president might want a law. He might negotiate with members of Congress and try to get some legislation passed. All presidents have some sort of agenda, some sort of legislative agenda. But Congress can say, no, we're not going with that. We like things the way they are. Or we want a different resolution to the problem. <coughs> Congress can enact its preferred solution or its preferred law. But the president can veto it. That's in the Constitution, too. But if enough members of the House and Senate are opposed to the president's veto, they want the legislation, they can override the veto. These are express powers given to the president, given to the Congress. Now, in some places, there is a kind of sharing of powers. Look, for example, at the uh, question of the war powers. The president is the commander in chief, right? That's in the Constitution, too. But who is supposed to <laughs> declare war? Congress. Who is supposed to undeclare it? Who gets to end the war? Do we have a vote in, co in Congress? Yeah, the president. So they're complicated. They look in the general in the foreign policy area. Presidents have vast power in foreign policy, but Congress has some power too. The Senate has ratification power in treaties. The Iran deal, the, the, the controversial Iran deal, how is it that President Trump can just blow up, walk out of the Iran deal that President Obama had signed? The Senate never ratified it. It wasn't proposed by President Obama as a treaty. Since it wasn't a treaty, get out. What if it were a treaty? Different situation had the Senate ratified. So in some areas, there has, we have a sharing of power. Now, what about the courts? Now, clearly, the most important power that the judiciary has, and especially the Supreme Court of the United States, let's see where it is June 2nd. So we're in the last month that the Supreme Court of the United States is in session. So we're all sitting here waiting. Aren't we right? 
to see when the gerrymander case is going to come down and when the Masterpiece Bake Shop case is going to come down and when the other big controversial cases are going to come down where the Supreme Court tells us what's allowed and what's not allowed, what democracy can establish and what it's not allowed to. The power of judicial review, the power to review legislation, state or federal, or executive action like the travel ban and make a declaration, or to use the more common phrase, strike down the legislation, or invalidate the uh, uh, legislative action. Now that power of judicial review, where's that in the Constitution? Is that in Article 3? <coughs> the judicial power of the United States shall? No, Article 1? Article 6. 11th Amendment? <laughs> no, wait, no, wait, no, wait. My students, you remember, my students at the beginning of the class, they tell me that the way the Constitution is supposed to protect liberty and prevent tyranny is by entrenching a Bill of Rights in the Constitution and giving the courts the power to enforce the Bill of Rights guarantees so that they can prevent the tyranny of the majority or the violation of individual rights. So that judicial review power, it's an extraordinary power, right? I mean, it's amazing. Much of our law is what it is, not because Congress and your elected representatives said this or that or the other thing, or the president signed a bill. It's because the Supreme Court decided the way it decided in certain areas. So that power of judicial review, it's got to be somewhere. Where is it? Oh! <laughs> Mr. Fair here, who studied with whom? Uh, with Alpheus Mason. With Alpheus T. Mason. He says it's in Marbury versus Madison. Now, what article of the Constitution is that? <laughs> you see where this is going? It's not in there. Or if it is in there, we have to say that it is implied. Now, that's what most people say. It's implied. And there is some significant evidence for that. Alexander Hamilton in Federalist Number 78 anticipates the courts exercising judicial review. Now, Hamilton is against the Bill of Rights. We're going to get to that later. <laughs> but he's for judicial review, and he thinks that it's in the Constitution, albeit only impliedly. Yeah. You can make that argument, and it has been the successful argument. That's what you're taught. In, have any of you been to law school? That's what you were taught in law school. But one of the things I love about constitutional interpretation, and we have this going all the way back to Corwin, uh, is that nothing is settled in the course in constitutional interpretation. No matter what they teach you in law school, we look at all constitutional issues afresh including the once very controversial question of whether the Constitution does permit courts to invalidate legislation. It's not written into the Constitution. And if it's implied, my goodness, that's a pretty powerful power to imply. Why leave it just If you really intend courts to exercise that I can use the word correctly. Awesome power. The kids overuse it. <laughs> this is the right, this is, it, this, it's literally awesome power. I mean, think of how much of our lives, how, many, how much of our law is what it is because the courts exercising the power of judicial review dictated that. If, it's, if it's, this awesome power is in there, is it really plausible that they just left it to be implied? Shouldn't they have listed it if it's gonna be this awesome? Well, I think the Hamiltonians would say, well, yeah, it's implied for all the reasons that Alexander Hamilton says in Federalist 78 it's implied. The trouble is it's been used way too extravagantly. Alexander Hamilton never imagined that the courts would be handing down or striking down legislation with the frequency that they do. And Alexander Hamilton never imagined 
that the courts would go beyond the text or strict logic or historical understanding of the Constitution to strike down legislation the way they seem to do all the time and have done through mo most of our history. Hamilton, in fact, argued that the judiciary was the, do you remember? Least dangerous branch. Why is it the least dangerous branch? Because whoever, and I quote, attentively, it's Federalist 78, whoever attentively considers the different departments of power must perceive that in a government in which they are separated from each other, separation of powers, the judiciary from the nature of its functions will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution because it will have the least capacity to annoy or injure them. The executive not only dispenses the honors but holds the sword of the community, commander in chief. The legislature not only commands the purse, spending, but prescribes the rules by which duties and rights of every citizen are to be regulated. The judiciary, on the contrary, has no influence over either the sword or the purse. No direction either of the strength or of the wealth of the society and can take no active resolution whatsoever. That means cases have to be brought to it. It can't just decide on its own, we're gonna hand down an edict. And here's the conclusion of what Hamilton says about it in Federalist 78. It may be truly said that the courts have neither force nor will, but merely judgment, and must ultimately depend upon the aid of the executive arm, even for the efficacy of its judgments. And what Hamilton has in mind there is the kind of thing that uh, we saw in the 1950s when the Supreme Court handed down its decision in Brown against the Board of Education ordering the desegregation of schools pursuant to the 14th Amendment's equal protection guarantee and where President Eisenhower had to send troops to Little Rock to enforce uh, the desegregation ruling that the local court down there made pursuant to the Supreme Court's decision in the Brown case. But can we today really believe that the courts are the least dangerous branch? That they have so little power to determine things that they can't be injurious to the rights of citizens? That this least democratic branch is also the safest, or at least the least powerful wouldn't Hamilton be surprised to find the court entering so many domains of life? And of course, Hamilton did not foresee, when he was writing Federalist 78, the addition of the Bill of Rights, which would be a mechanism by which, exercising judicial review, the courts would involve themselves in so many of the nation's hot button disputes. But, our friend over here, who was a student of Professor Mason. Also Archibald Cox. Also Archibald Cox. <laughs> but he was at uh, another the other, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he was a fine man and a good constitutional scholar. Uh, Archibald Cox was the, the special prosecutor in the Watergate case who was fired by, uh, at, the, at the behest of President Nixon uh, on the uh, Saturday night uh, uh, massacre. Uh, who was, by the way, someone who was very sensitive to this question of excessive judicial power, thinking in many areas the courts had gone far. It was a kind of Hamiltonian himself who believed in judicial review, but thought that uh, the courts had not proven to be uh, the least dangerous branch. Uh, in any event, our friend here mentioned Marbury against Madison. And he's right to mention it, because that is the case in 1803 in which, according to the standard view, the court discovered its power of judicial review implied in the Constitution. Now, whether that traditional view is right or wrong, uh, we'll lay aside for the moment. But this much we do know. 
The Supreme Court in 1803, in Marbury against Madison, in a position, in, a, in an opinion handed down by Justice John, Chief Justice John Marshall, known as the great Chief Justice. He wasn't the first Chief Justice, he was the fourth Chief Justice. Who was the first Chief Justice? John Jay. John Jay. Well done. He's the guy who built the court's power and served for a long, long time until the Jackson uh, administration when Chief Justice Taney became Chief Justice. But this much certainly happened. In that opinion, in Marbury versus Madison, the court held that it could not legitimately, constitutionally act on jurisdiction purportedly given to it by the Congress of the United States where Congress itself was acting unconstitutionally in expanding the jurisdiction of the court. Those of you who remember the case will remember that it's kind of complicated in its details. It had to do with whether the court could exercise original jurisdiction, that is, be the trial court, not just an appellate court, could be the trial court in a case involving a mandamus where Mr. Uh, Marbury had been given a judicial appointment, appointed as a justice of the peace by the outgoing Adams administration as the Jefferson administration was coming in. And uh, the Jefferson administration, once it came in, refused to uh, give a commission that had already been signed and sealed uh, to Mr. Marbury. So Mr. Marbury comes into court, Supreme Court of the United States, and says, make the Jeffersonians give me my commission because that commission became effective when President Adams signed it and Secretary of State Madison sealed it. If you recall, the court actually sympathizes substantively with Mr. Marbury. They think he should get his commission. But they rule that Mr. Marbury brought the case to the wrong court. Because as the Supreme Court, its original jurisdiction, the areas in which it could function as a trial court, were limited to those expressly stated in Article Three, And this was not such a case. The court said Congress purported to do that in a section of the Judiciary Act of 1789. But in doing that, it had acted unconstitutionally. So Chief Justice Marshall and this fellow justices, unanimous opinion, said, we cannot exercise this power. Now, I want you to pause for a moment to think this through with me. What is Justice, Marbury, uh, Justice Marshall saying? He's saying, I, heaven forfend, that I should exercise power that's been unconstitutionally given to me, power that I haven't been given by the Constitution. But in doing so, you'll notice, he is claiming the power to interpret and treat as unconstitutional an act of Congress, something that is not explicitly granted to the court in the Constitution. So he's expanding judicial power while at the same time he's saying, I'm refusing to exercise power I haven't been given. And he's got the Jeffersonians perfectly over a barrel. What are they going to do? What are they going to say? He's actually just ruled for them, but ruled for them in a way that expanded judicial power way beyond what the Jeffersonians thought was appropriate. As a matter of fact, Jefferson himself, who was, the, think of the time, who, Jefferson himself, who was Marshall's cousin, political opponent, but, but cousin, Jefferson himself would, would later say that if the Marbury principle is allowed to stand, we will have turned ourselves as a country over to the despotism of an oligarchy. If the courts, with no express grant of power in the Constitution, can invalidate, even by way of refusing to act on, 
a congressional statute. We will no longer be a Republican government. We will be a despot, uh, a, uh, an oligarchy. It'll be like living under Napoleon. But again, what could Jefferson do about it? Absolutely nothing. The court had ruled in his favor. Mr. Marbury isn't given his commission. Now notice something else. Technically, nothing in Marbury, argue with me if you disagree, <laughs> having studied with two men far greater than me, than I, Argue, argue with me if you disagree, but um, notice that in Marbury against Madison, the court does not purport to tell Congress what it can and can't do. It doesn't say to Congress, the Judiciary Act of 1789 in pertinent part is unconstitutional and therefore you can't act on it. All he says is, because we think it's unconstitutional in pertinent part, we can't act on it. Now, when we think of judicial review today, we think of the court as claiming that it has the power not only to refuse itself to act on statutes or grants of power that it believes are unconstitutional, we think of it as the court telling the president, you can't do this, or the court telling the Congress, you can't do it. When uh, the court struck down the campaign finance laws in Citizens United, everybody familiar with the Citizens United case? Yep. When the court invalidated the McCain-Feingold law, a substantial part of it, it didn't just say, well, we as a court are just not going to act on the McCain-Feingold law in any way that would pertain to us because, you know, we think that's unconstitutional. The court was dictating to Congress and the President what they could do and what they could not do. That's how we think of judicial review today. So there's a question even about what it is that got established in Marbury against Madison. Was it full-blown judicial review in the sense that the court was telling Congress what it could and couldn't do? Or was it this much more limited thing of, well, look, you know, you guys can decide for yourselves what you think the Constitution permits you to do or forbids you from doing, but we've decided that the Constitution does not permit us to have original jurisdiction over a mandamus case like this. Notice something else. For the rest of Chief Justice Marshall's long tenure on the court, the court did not strike down another federal statute. Not one. And so we never got, even by way of a later case, any further clarity on exactly what power the court was claiming in Marbury against Madison. When is the next time a court strikes down in our national history, when after Marbury is the next time a court strikes down a federal statute? Missouri, 1857. Missouri Compromise, Dred Scott. Scott, Missouri Compromise, exactly right. So we move all the way to the 1850s and we've got a new Chief Justice and this time there's no doubt about what the court is claiming. Okay, now Dred Scott, who is he? He's a slave. Sanford's the slave master. Sanford takes Dred Scott with him from his slave state home into free United States territory. Dred Scott says, wait a minute. I'm now on free soil. The traditional once free, always free rule applies to me. Sanford, my master, effectively manumitted me when he took me on to free soil. I'm now a free man, and he goes into court and says, I want my freedom. And he actually initially wins in the Missouri trial court. But the case makes its way all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. 
where Chief Justice Taney from Maryland, who had been a slaveholder but who had freed his slaves, Chief Justice Taney, for a divided court, this time we do have dissent, says that Congress lacks the power to forbid slavery in the federal territories. Sanford is a citizen of the United States. He has full rights as a citizen of the United States. He can travel with his property, whether that property is a suitcase uh, or uh, a horse or a slave into territory of the United States without losing any of his rights. And the decision in Dred Scott does even more than that. It does more than simply tell Congress, you can't forbid slavery in the federal territories. It says, blacks, even free blacks, are not citizens of the United States and cannot be citizens of the United States. They are members of, quote, that unfortunate race, unquote who as people who are not citizens of the United States can't even have access to the federal courts. Now, of course, this throws kerosene onto the already raging fire in the country over the central moral issue of the day, the big social issue of the day, slavery. There is a theory that's been advanced by a number of historians, I don't know if it's true, that what the court in Dred Scott was trying to do was not so much advance the cause of slavery. After all, Tawney had freed his own slaves. Not so much advance the cause of slavery as to try to diffuse, defuse the slavery issue by, quote, taking it out of politics, unquote, judicializing it so that it could uh, be taken out of politics where it was just poisonous, where it was toxic. Well, if that is in fact right, if that's what Tawney and his fellow justices in the majority were actually trying to do, they failed abysmally. Because the net result politically of Dred Scott was to further inflame the slavery question. And it becomes the centerpiece of the debates between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Justice Stephen Justice, Stephen Douglas. Stephen Justice is a friend of mine who teaches at Berkeley. <laughs> Don't tell him I made that mistake. The Dred Scott decision becomes the centerpiece of the debate between Douglas and Lincoln when they were squared off against each other for the Senate in Illinois in 1858. Now, Douglas won that election. Remember, this is. This is before the Constitution was amended to have the direct election of senators, so it was ultimately going to be the uh, state legislature that decided. But the debates were carried on uh, across Illinois, both south and uh, north. Illinois is a, you know, a long state uh, horizontal like that. Uh, and everywhere they went, the question was, what about Dred Scott? Basically, Douglas defended it and said, look, the Supreme Court has the authority to pass on the constitutionality of legislation. It's up to the Supreme Court to say whether legislation is constitutional or not. If the Supreme Court declares a statute to be unconstitutional, then that binds the Congress, that binds the President, that finishes the issue. They've ruled on it. It's not within our province as senators or future senators. That's the court's business. It doesn't matter whether I like the decision or don't like the decision. Douglas wanted to avoid stating an opinion one way or another. He wanted to say it's up to the court. But Lincoln had a different view. A view that to our ears today, especially those of us who have been to law school, sounds radical. Because in law school, what is drilled into your head, or at least what was drilled into mine, was that the Constitution not only establishes judicial review, it establishes judicial supremacy. That where the Supreme Court strikes down legislation, it speaks not only for itself, it does more than just give an opinion. It binds not only itself, it binds the other branches of the government. So if the Congress enacts the statute and the, the court declares it to be unconstitutional, 
Congress loses. That was not Lincoln's view. As radical as it might sound to our ears today, the view of the great emancipator, defended through the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and then in his first inaugural address, was that ordinarily, ordinarily, the president ought to defer to the court on a constitutional question, because that's the prudentially best course, ordinarily, but where a decision is not only wrong, but constitutes a grave usurpation of the authority of the people themselves acting through their representatives in Congress, the president is under no obligation to treat it as a binding rule. In the first inaugural address, now he's president. Now he's in a position where he doesn't just have to talk about Dred Scott, which he's happy to do. He's now in a position where he has to do something about Dred Scott. He's got to decide whether he's going to comply with it or not. And in his first inaugural address, he says, I'm not going to comply. I will treat any wayward case like Dred Scott as binding on the parties to the suit as to the subject of the suit. But I will not treat it as a binding rule applicable to any, much less all, other cases. To do that, to yield to the court, Lincoln said, would be to abandon our government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. I'm quoting him. Lincoln said it was the president's duty in the case of a grave usurpation to defy the court. When we hear that, especially those of us who've been to law school, we think that is executive lawlessness because we tend to think of the law as what the court says. Who gets to say what the law is? The court. Lincoln says, well, they're entitled to their opinion, <laughs> but so is Congress, and so am I as president. And what did Abraham Lincoln do? Solvig, what did he do about Dred Scott? <laughs> How about you, Micah? Yeah, he becomes president. Now, remember what Dred Scott held. Not only does Congress lack the power to ban slavery in the federal territories, blacks can't be citizens. So Lincoln proposes legislation, which now he's got a Republican Congress, he proposes legislation to ban slavery in the federal territories, and it passes. And he does something else. He orders the Department of Secretary of State to issue passports to free blacks. He orders the Patent Office to issue patents to black inventors. In other words, he defies the court's ruling that blacks can't be citizens. He treats blacks as citizens. Was he right or wrong? The people who say, and you've heard this many times, I'm sure, Lincoln was a tyrant. The people who say Lincoln was a tyrant are not only referring to his suspension of habeas corpus. They were referring to his defiance of court orders. Not strictly speaking, because he was willing to enforce them on the parties to the suit but his defiance of the court when it came to the putative obligation to comply with the court's principle, with the principle that the court had handed down. If you were complying with the court's principle, you could not have issued passports to blacks or patents. So we might or might not believe that the Constitution empowers the courts to exercise judicial review. If we do believe that the Constitution empowers the court or the courts to exercise judicial review, we may or may not believe that judicial review means judicial supremacy. 
We might take the more limited view that would be suggested by the reading of Marbury that has Ju Chief Justice Marshall saying, look, I'm just not going to act. We in the court are not going to act in our own uh, activities, in our own uh, work, on a rule that we believe is unconstitutional. We're not going to exercise jurisdiction that we believe was conferred upon us unconstitutionally. But today, judicial supremacy is sort of taken for granted. I mean, imagine the uproar if a president said, let's say President Obama would have said, you know, Citizens United is an outrage. Speech isn't money. Money isn't speech. This is the court simply making up constitutional law, imposing its own political agenda on the country. I'm not going to abide by that there probably would have been an uproar. I'm sure there would have been an uproar. Or if President Trump said, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna comply with a court order. Of course he might. <laughs> <laughs> but if he did, would our reaction one way or the other depend on whether we like President Trump or not? Or whether we like President Obama or not? or whether we happen to like this policy of President Trump's or that policy of President Obama's, whether we happen to like the travel ban, or whether we happen to like or dislike the McCain-Feingold finance bill. I, I would submit to you that we ought to aspire to a principled view that would be grounded in a principle that we are prepared to live by, whether we like the president or don't like the president, whether we like this policy that the president is uh, acting for, or we dislike the policy. Whatever our view is, whether it's a limited judicial review view, or a no judicial review view, or a judicial supremacy view, surely it ought to be a principled view, and not just reflect our judgment of a particular president or of a particular policy. Well, let's look at the overall record when it comes to judicial review. How do we decide what our own position on judicial review should be? We know that it's not explicitly in the Constitution. We know that a pretty good case can be made and has been made, beginning with Marbury versus Madison, that judicial review is implied in the Constitution. It's not a knockdown. But a pretty good case can be made. Hamilton thought it was. Should we draw up a grand balance sheet? Should we say, well, on the whole, judicial review at this level or that level has been good for the country? Or judicial review has been bad for the country? Most of us would say, gosh, it was great that we had judicial review because we got Brown versus Board of Education. That's a great decision. But it was the same judicial review that gave us Dred Scott against Sanford, or Lochner against New York, that maximum working, hour, working hours case in 1905. Five. Five. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to have your preceptors with you. <laughs> and then what about Citizens United, or Roe versus Wade, or Obergefell, or, or the gerrymandering case that's about to come down one way or another? Should our views about judicial review depend on what our policy positions are on those things? I mean, the typical American, I, I regret to say, the typical American will open his paper in the morning or go to his website in the morning, and he'll, he'll see that the Supreme Court has handed down a certain decision, and he'll either applaud or boo, depending on whether he likes the policy that ends up being in place as a result of the decision. But if we were really being principled about it, if we understood our Constitution and were willing to take a principled view of the matter, we would not consider a question to be resolved. We wouldn't decide whether to cheer or to boo, depending on whether we like the policy that results or is left standing or is put into place. We'd rather ask ourselves the question, well, did the court have the authority to act in this area? Did the court have the authority to hand down this decision. I mean, the court did not invalidate the Vietnam War, although there were some people who thought that the court should. 
I mean, the, the court said, look, we're going to stay away from, you know, the, the, that, that kind of intervention into the war-making power of the President and the Congress. But there was a lot, I mean, remember back to those of you who are of a certain age, as I am, will remember the intensity of feeling during the Vietnam War. Had the court invalidated the war, probably a lot of people would have cheered, saying, yeah, great, the court has ended this war. But would that have been the right decision constitutionally? Wouldn't the real question be, constitutionally, does the court have the power to make a decision about a war, whether we like the war or don't like the war? And that's just one example. You can go into any of a range of other areas. Before we close, I want to get to one final issue. That giggling at the beginning, when I mentioned my students responding to the question, how does the Constitution protect liberty and prevent tyranny, by uh, saying, well, the Constitution contains a Bill of Rights. The giggle started right there, absolutely rightly. You were right to giggle. Because, as you know, the Constitution originally did not have a Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights are the first eight amendments. So why didn't the Constitution include a Bill of Rights? Why did they have to be added by amendments? Now, they were added very quickly, just a couple of years after ratification of the Constitution. But why did they have to be? We revere our Bill of Rights, don't we? We're proud of our Bill of Rights. Did they forget and say, oh, wait, yeah, forgot. And I told you that Hamilton opposed the Bill of Rights. So did Madison. Did those great heroes? One, a Princeton man, the other guy who tried to get to Princeton? <laughs> were they bad guys who were against rights? Were they against liberties? Were they against freedom? Why did they oppose a Bill of Rights? These revered heroes opposed the Bill of Rights. They were added over the objection. I mean, Madison did a deal, as Madison usually did. But they objected. Guys like Hamilton objected to the Bill of Rights. Now, why? If they didn't forget, and if they're not actually authoritarians who don't believe in freedom, why did they not get on board right away with including a Bill of Rights in the Constitution? The federal government had no power. Say more, Steve. The federal government. So Hamilton is reasoning, Mr. Whelan is exactly right, Hamilton's reasoning that, look, the fundamental protection for liberty is the delegated powers doctrine of the national government. Now, a Bill of Rights makes perfect sense, like the English Bill of Rights of the Glorious Revolution, as applied against a government of general jurisdiction exercising police powers. Makes perfect sense. But if you've got a government that's not a government of general jurisdiction, but is a government of delegated and enumerated powers, a Bill of Rights logically makes no sense. At most, it's just an echo of what everyone should already understand. That is, the federal government has been given no power to establish a church, interfere with the exercise of religion, prohibit the freedom of speech, or the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assembly and assemble and, and uh, petition the government for redress of grievances, or take away people's guns, or shelter soldiers in people's homes, or any of the other things in the Bill of Rights. And more than that, it's not just that Hamilton thought the Bill of Rights was unnecessary and illogical and didn't make sense as running against a government of general jurisdiction. He thought there was something dangerous about a Bill of Rights. Now hold off Steve. What did he think was dangerous? That if you listed some, yeah. it would imply that the ones that weren't listed were still granted. Exactly. <laughs> that in a Bill of Rights, you can, how many are you going to list? 20, 40, 100? Even if you list 200, you're not going to be able to list all the rights people have. If the government's a government of delegated powers, it's just got these powers and everything else are rights the people have. So if you list some, 
that could be taken by the people and worse still by their rulers, by public officials, to imply that really the only limitations on federal power are the limitations of the Bill of Rights. It could undermine the delegated powers theory, which was supposed to be the way liberty is really protected, by limiting government. And worse yet, not only would it undermine that protection, it would miseducate the people about the basis of their own liberty. And in a Republican regime, it ultimately falls to the people to be the guardians of their own liberty. If they don't understand it, they can't protect it. Madison famously said, only a well-educated people can permanently be a free people. That is a people who knows the foundations, knows the theory, knows the philosophical basis of their liberty. Only such a people is in a position to protect Republican liberty, to protect Republican government, the liberty that we have as citizens of a Republican regime, or what we might today call a democratic republic. He also knew that if you list some and not others, it will suggest that these are the ones that are the most important. But how can you, in the abstract, say which are the most important? How do you compare the right to free speech to the right to your reputation? Is one weightier or more important than the other? If I use my free speech to say that Mr. Whelan embezzled from his law firm, <laughs> which is the weightier right, my right to speak or his right not to have his reputation impugned? Now notice, by the way, the absoluteness of the terms of, say, the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. No law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the right to freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to assemble and peaceably uh, address the government for redress of grievances. Absolute terms. Congress shall make no law. Why could it speak in those terms? What about slander and libel? Why don't I, under the First Amendment, have a right falsely to accuse Mr. Whelan of embezzling from his law firm? I, I guarantee you that if I do that, Steve sues me and I lose, <laughs> despite the First Amendment. And the answer, Mr. Fetter? State law. State law. It says Congress shall make no law. Congress hasn't been given the delegated power even to make slander and libel laws. Who's got the power to do that? The states. Why? Not because something in the Constitution confers the power explicitly on the states. Under the theory, states don't need express delegations of power. As governments of general jurisdiction, they have plenary power, the police power to protect public health, safety, and morals, and advance the common good by doing things like creating private causes of action for slander or libel. Now, as uh, we'll close with this, as many of you know, with respect to most of the Bill of Rights guarantees, the courts have held, starting in the 1920s and going up to today, the Supreme Court of the United States has held, that those guarantees are incorporated into the 14th Amendment via its due process clause so that they now apply not only to the national government but also to the states, which creates the following dilemma or puzzle. How do we make sense of the absoluteness of the phrasing, Congress shall make no law, no law? How do we make sense of that while at the same time conceding that states can legitimately, constitutionally do things like protect Mr. Whelan's or your or my right to reputation by creating causes of action for slander and libel. But that is where things are left today. And it's been an enormous pleasure having you back at Princeton, and thank you for coming to Constitutional Interpretation. <laughs> Thank 
you. I appreciate it. Thank you. In 33 years at Princeton, I don't think Professor George has ever attended a pee raid. So let's show him what it's like to receive a locomotive. Here, here, run, 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 tiger, 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 sis, 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 boom, 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 boom